In this video, we're going to look at four tips for troubleshooting problems in Godot games. When working on your game, do you ever have that feeling like, this code is just not doing what I want? Even when you're reading through it, it seems fine, but there's still a weird bug or unexpected behavior? That happens to me all the time, it happens to all programmers. By the end of this video, you'll have a solid foundation of many of the troubleshooting tools provided to you by Godot. Before we get started, quick note that I upload game dev tutorials and content to this YouTube channel. If you're interested in that kind of thing, please subscribe. So let's take a look at the demo code for this video. Um, I've got a method called defeat enemies, and that takes in an array of enemies. Each enemy is a dictionary that has enemy name as a string, like bat, um, gives XP, which is an integer, like 25, and then sometimes there's an extra flag called has bonus, and that's just a Boolean, true or false. If that's true, I wanna double the XP that you get from defeating this enemy. Now let's take a look at the logic of defeat enemies. Uh, so for each enemy in the list, what I want to do is check if the enemy has the has bonus flag. We're going to go ahead and take our XP, which is a member variable, and add whatever enemy.gives XP is, but multiply it by 2 to get that 2x bonus. However, if that flag is not present or it's false, we just want to add whatever the regular gives XP amount is. So how do I know this method is actually doing what I think it's doing? Well, the first technique for troubleshooting, debugging, what we're going to look at is just printing output to the console. And so for that, Godot has a command called print. You may have seen it before. It's pretty basic, but it's very effective. Print can take in any number of values. And so you could have a string like hello, or you could have a variable, like in our case XP right now. And when I run the game, we're going to be able to see the output of print right here in the output tab. And as you can see, this is a little bit not pleasant to read because Godot by default will just smash all the values together right in a row. Uh, what you can do is add an S at the end of print here, S, and this S stands for space. And when I save and run that, now Godot will separate the values with a space. And if you want even more cushion, you can, instead of using S, you can use T, and that T stands for tab. And now when I run the code, Godot is going to insert a tab between the values. Now let's maybe take this message and make it more helpful. Right now it lives in the block for when the enemy has bonus points. So we'll say um, doubling XP gain, and now our current XP is here. Let's go ahead and add another block though, another print method in the other case. And this time we're gonna use a slightly fancier version. Uh, there's regular print, but then there's also print underscore debug. And let's see, we'll just say this is a regular XP add. And then again, we'll give it the XP amount. When I run print debug, it's gonna include an extra bit of information here. And that information is where in the code that that print line executed. So this is really useful if you end up having a lot of print lines in your code, you can kind of easily lose track of where they all are and where they're coming from. And so by including this extra little bit here, you'll have more information to make it easier to track down where that print is. And now just by observing the console here, you can kind of trace the events that have happened. So first we get a regular HP ad, and we know that because it's the debug line. Uh, and then we get another one, and then we get a double, a double, and then another one. And if we compare that to the array that we're passing in, it kind of lines up, right? Regular, regular, double, double, regular. To wrap up print, let's just go ahead and just explore one more example. Say at the end of it, I kind of want to, you know, like a recap of the points that I have now after all of this looping. So I'm going to say print here. And let's say that we actually want kind of a fancier, more in-depth debug message here, what you can do is actually use string format templating to kind of make the log a little bit more friendly to read. And so we'll say, you know, gained this many XP by defeating N enemies. Now to populate these little variables here, what I can do is come to the end of the string, add a method, dot format, and then in format, we're gonna pass it a dictionary. And in the dictionary, you define the key value pair of what you want injected into the string. So we'll say XP is gonna be our XP, and that's pointed to our member variable up here, the thing that we're incrementing. And N is gonna be enemies.size. That's the length of this enemies array. So I'll save and run the code. And at the very end, we get a nice little recap, gain 230 by defeating five enemies. So the takeaway here is that if you have some sort of complicated or looping logic and you want to be able to trace kind of what's happening in every step of that piece, print can be a basic but effective way of giving yourself a nice logging history of everything that's happening in that method. That said, there's an even more advanced and effective way of kind of navigating this kind of code, and that's by using the debugger, which brings us to tip number two.
Okay, so tip number two. I've gone ahead and removed all of our print lines that we added before, and I'm just gonna give us a little bit more space here inside the loop. Uh, do you see this area to the left of the line numbers? If you click anywhere in that gutter, say like right here on line 16, it's gonna place one of these red dots, and that red dot is called a breakpoint. Now when Godot is executing our code and it sees one of these breakpoints, it's gonna stop right there and halt everything and give us a moment to kind of look around and inspect what's going on. So go ahead and run the code. And now you can see the code is stopped right here. Line 16 is where our breakpoint is and it's kind of highlighted here to show us that it has stopped. Um, and here you can see that Godot in the debugger area has listed out a bunch of variables for us. So we have references to the, en the local variables, like the enemies that we're iterating through right now, um, which enemy that we're on, so this one in the iteration. And then we also have our member variables too. So our XP, you can see that it's at zero because we're, we've stopped right here in the first iteration, haven't made it that far into the loop. So let's go ahead and continue. Now this continue button is gonna resume the execution of the code uh, and it'll just basically keep going until it hits another breakpoint. And so because we're in a loop and I hit continue, it went ahead and finished the iteration here and gained, you know, we gained our 25 points for our first enemy. You can see that working here. And then now that it hit another iteration, or I'm sorry, it hit another breakpoint, it stopped there again, giving us another chance to kind of stop and look around. And now right next to the continue button, there's uh, two more buttons here that we're gonna talk about. This one on the right is called step over. And you can also just hit F10 to fire it. But if I click it, it's gonna start stepping through the code, which means it's gonna run line by line, one line for every step that I do. And that way we can just slowly kind of trace through what the code is doing. So I'll go ahead and step over. Now I'm on line 17. It's gonna evaluate, you know, do I have the has bonus points flag? If I click it one more time, you see that it went to line 20 because we didn't have the flag. So it went to the else case and I'll just kind of keep going. Okay, another iteration. This time we do have the flag, so you can see that it went in here. And remember, all the while, you can see that XP is live updating right here as we go. It's also worth noting that you can hover over anything in the code editor here, and Godot will tell you what that is, which is really handy. Let's continue stepping through. And you can do that all the way until the code finishes. Now to compare this with the workflow of printing things to the console, like we looked at before, um, Instead of having to sprinkle in all those print lines everywhere and then run the game and then look at the output tab and kind of compare what we saw to what we expected to see, uh, this is much more convenient because you can just slowly step through everything that's happening along the way without needing to like boot up the game and run through the whole thing every time. If you start to get in the habit of using the debugger instead, you're probably gonna be able to get to the bottom of bugs much faster. Now I'm gonna add just a tiny bit more code here to show you something else. Let's say we have a different method that's called I don't know, add more XP. I'm just kind of making this up as we go. It's gonna add XP, you know, 10, and then just doing something goofy here, 20, 30, 40. Now at the end of this loop here, I'm gonna go ahead and use our other, you know, new method, add more XP. And then at the end of that, I'm gonna just print, you know, we're done adding XP. I'm gonna add just one more quick line here when we're done with the loop. And now I've taken away our breakpoint at line 16, and instead I'm gonna place a different one right here on line 21 when that loop is over. Now when I run the code, it's gonna stop after our XP loop. And I wanna show you the difference between these two stepping options. The one we've been using so far is called step over, but right next to that one is a different option called step into. And so here's the difference. We are currently debugging inside the function defeat enemies. And so what step over is gonna do when it stops at this breakpoint is that any other function calls that happen, technically the next thing in the code that would run are all the contents of that function. And so say we do add more XP, uh, we're gonna hit this line and then this function is gonna start and then it's gonna do this line, this line, this line, this line, and then it's gonna come back and we'll be back in our function here. Sometimes when you're debugging, it can be kind of disorienting when the debugger jumps around on you. This is kind of a simple example, but in more complex projects, the next function that runs may be like in a whole new file or a completely different place in the code. And so what step over is gonna say is that any external function we come across, just like this one, it's gonna go ahead and fast forward through all the executing and just plop us out on the other side. So here, all of the code inside add more XP did run, 
but the debugger didn't take us through it line by line. And so that's where this neighboring button step into comes in. It's going to execute and then it's going to keep going line by line, no matter what's happening to see that the debugger bounced us into this other function here. We keep going when we're done with this one, it's going to bring us through on the other side. And now we're back to the function that we started debugging in. Using step over versus step into can kind of depend on the kind of detail you're looking for. Sometimes you don't really care what's going to happen in that other method. Uh, maybe the bug you're interested in, like the problems happening on the other side, or that part's just not really relevant. Sometimes it is. And so if you need to go super fine detail of absolutely everything that's happening, that's where step into can be your friend. So that wraps up our tip around the debugger. Next time you're working with your code and something doesn't seem like it's working right, try placing one of these breakpoints and navigating through the code this way to have more clarity on exactly what's going on and when. Now for our third and fourth tip today, I've set us up a little bit of a test scene. I'm gonna walk you through that right now. Um, here we have main scene is what it's called. There's uh, a color rect to give it this kind of green background and then some blades of grass to make it feel all outdoorsy. So those are just sprites. And then we have a sprite called character that's in the middle of the screen. Popping over to the new demo code here, uh, when the scene enters the tree, we're gonna make a new variable called some variable. We'll use this in a second. And then we're gonna set up a timer. So I have T is a new timer. We're gonna connect to the timer's timeout signal. And when that happens, we're gonna go ahead and fire our move character method, which lives right here. Um, the timer's interval is gonna be a half a second, 0 0.5, and then we've made sure that one shot is turned off. And so on, in a timer, when one shot is turned off, that means that the timer's gonna repeat firing at that cadence. So it'll be fire, 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 fire. It'll keep going every half second. Then we're gonna add the timer to the scene and then start the counting. When move character fires, it's simply gonna take our character, grab the position X and add 10 pixels to it. And one thing to note, we are creating and adding this timer with code. It doesn't initially live in our scene tree. We're kind of dynamically adding it on the fly. And so when I run the code, you can see that it's working fine. The character's moving a little bit to the side every half second. But let's say that I wanna pass more information into this move character signal. Um, say that I you know, grab some variable here. It's not really doing anything right now, but just to show you, if we pass it in here, and now I rerun the code, the character's not moving anymore. It's like this thing isn't wired up and working anymore. Notice down here, the debugger number is starting to go wild. It's incrementing every half second. If I click on this and then see this error tab, it also has that same number that's going up and open that up. You can see that Godot is giving me this warning. Basically the connected signal expected zero arguments, but I called one. And so when that happens, the signal still fired, but this particular connected function did not because of that argument mismatch. And so to fix it, we basically need to be ready to accept this argument. And now when I rerun the code, you can see that it works again. And so the takeaway here is that sometimes your code may not be firing at all when you expect it to, and you're not getting like any clear runtime errors or crashes or anything like that. It's just something's not happening. Pop over to this error tab and see if it's warning you about anything. It's very likely that maybe you have one of these mismatches or something else isn't quite wired up right. The error tab will tell you hopefully what's going wrong. And finally, our last technique for today is gonna to be learning to use the remote tab for debugging the live scene tree of your actual running game. And so again, here's our main scene. It's got all of the nodes that we've set up during development. But if I run the game, you see that this extra section appears. We have local and remote. So if I click over to remote, the scene tree here is gonna to switch to the actual scene tree that's running inside our live game, this one right here. And so see that the tree mostly looks the same, except there's this extra timer. And that timer is the one that we dynamically played with and added with code. And so here, if you wanna grab the timer and kind of make sure that everything was set properly on it, you can even play with the values in real time and the game will update. So now that just increased it to like six, we'll go down like crazy. Um, let's see where our character is. By now our character is completely off the screen. Uh, but what I can do, say I need to be like, hey, come back here. What I can do is inspect the character, find his X position and see that it's slowly, well, quickly updating every, uh, every time that timer goes off. I can just grab it and sort of live edit it. So I'll say now you're at zero. And when I did that, our character warped all the way back here in real time. 
And so I have two main takeaways for the remote tab. The first is that if you run your game and maybe things that are dynamically placed end up in weird places, like they're off screen and don't kind of line up with where you expected them to be, instead of just guessing, get in here with the remote tab, find them in the tree and look at where they landed with their positions. You can then just move them around from there and kind of figure out why they landed where they did. The second main takeaway is that if you're working on tweaking presentational stuff, like uh, maybe UI positions or animation speeds or things like that, you can try them out right here in context of the running game rather than tweaking the code, stopping the game, rebooting the game, tweaking the code again, that kind of workflow. You can get it right where you want it right here and then just commit it to the code when you know what you want. Alrighty, that's the end of the four tips. We had print, we had the debugger, we had the error tab, and we had the remote tab. I hope you take these tips, integrate them into your workflow, and be more productive than ever. If you got some value out of this video, I really appreciate it when you hit the like button. And again, if you're interested in this kind of content, subscribe for more. I have more Godot videos on this channel. So if you're interested in that, one more is gonna play right after this one. Be sure to stick around. And finally, if you've been working on a game or you have an idea for a game, but you're not really quite sure how to get started, you should join our Discord. We've got a supportive group of people that are making and playing indie games. So if you have an idea for a project or you've been working on a project, pop in there, tell us about it. We'd love to see you there. That's all for this one. Thanks, everybody. Catch you next time.